Hi, everybody. I'm Alistair Stevenson. Welcome to episode six of Storms on the Way, a discussion of Neil Gaiman's classic text, American Gods. This week, we are going to visit the end of chapter five, and then we are going to push on with great purpose, with absolute clarity and precision, and with absolutely no distractions into chapter six. I will finish chapter six by the end of today's session. That is a solemn promise from me to you. I don't have that many slides. I should be able to get through it. It should be just fine, you guys. This is episode six of Storms on the Way because episode five was released earlier today. That wasn't a live session. It was a podcast session in which I discussed the first episode of the TV show with the wonderful Elizabeth Stevens and the equally wonderful Daphne Olive. We spent, well, I guess almost an hour and three quarters talking about an hour's worth of television, talking about that amazing, impressive, surprisingly well-crafted, and oddly inconsistent first episode of the Star's adaptation of American Gods. There was a lot there to discuss. If you have somehow missed that, if you somehow haven't yet had the opportunity to go and catch up with that episode, it should be in your podcast feeds right now. As I said, we're going to push through all the way to the end of chapter six today, and we are going to get to the first big turning point in this novel, the moment at which the, the frame of this conflict is, is incontrovertibly established. It is the moment at which the book really begins to assume the kind of grandiose mythic weight that it will ultimately carry through the rest of its run. So this is a very big chapter. I certainly don't want to miss anything important. As I said, we're going to be moving just a little swiftly. Um, Vivian says in the YouTube chat that she just paused episode five to watch episode six, and it was a good discussion. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yes. <laughs> Jonathan says, kind of bummed we didn't get to jump in on the Bone Orchard episode. Yeah, I was thinking about that after the discussion. Um, it would be really fun to have that kind of, of this kind, I should say, of, of live interactivity when we're discussing the show too, but there are technical obstacles to doing that kind of thing and editing being what it is and recording schedules certainly being what they are. We just have to set that aside. But I'm really hopeful that sometime toward the end of June, probably either right before or right after the last episode of American Gods airs, we'll actually have Daphne here in Oklahoma City. So we'll all be able to sit around and do some kind of, of live Q&A about the show, hopefully. I can promise no more than that because, as I said, schedules being what they are, the life of a podcaster is a random one. Aaron says, yes, I have many opinions on that episode. It has certainly, um, it has certainly been met with a, a very positive critical response, a very positive popular response, certainly, but there are some textual inconsistencies. There are some issues, I think, just with the production. The choice of music isn't perhaps always quite what we would hope that it was. There are certainly observable pacing issues in the uh, in the back half of the first episode. And there are some issues about tone and, and voice, I suppose. But it's also the first episode in an eight episode run and you can't really judge a book by its first you know three chapters. So I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the show. I, I'm very, very positive on it. I think maybe if I had to give like a letter grade, it would be somewhere between an A and an A minus. It, it's it's certainly in that kind of ballpark for the first episode. So I'm really hopeful that uh, things will will continue to improve as we move through the eight episode arc. Yes, and Aaron says I could talk for an hour about what they did to Bilquis. Um, let's see, now I'm pronouncing it the way they pronounce it on the TV show. Having just trained myself to pronounce her name Bilquis, now I'm going to move back to pronouncing it Bilquis so that I'm consistent with Brian Fuller's vision of this character. Um, Vivian says they're not trying to do the complete novel in eight episodes, right? Uh, no, they are not. Although exactly what that means is still a little up in the air. There have been some very contradictory statements coming out of the production company behind the star's adaptation of American Gods, including at least one assertion that the entire novel was going to be covered in the first episode. Obviously that isn't true. And the more common idea that basically the show is going to run through to the end of chapter six, through to, to the discussion that we're going to have today. But obviously if you've looked at the cast lists, if you if you have a sense of, of who they've brought in, the kind of characters that we're going to be seeing over the course of the next the next seven episodes, the remaining seven episodes, then it's clear that they're not strictly adhering to the book. I was surprised during the first episode how closely they cleaved to the structure of the first couple of chapters. I thought that was very bold and very provocative. But of course, simple math tells you that if they're only running through to the end of chapter six and they covered the first two chapters in the first episode, then we're going to be bringing in extra material from later in the book. I have no idea. I know no more than you do. But I can tell you that I'm looking forward to next week's discussion. I want to um, 
I guess before I do anything else, I should tell you how you can get in touch with me about American Gods. If you are listening to this after the fact, you can email me at pointnorthmedia at gmail.com, or you can find me on Twitter using the hashtag storms, O-T-W, S-T-O-R-M-S-O-T-W, for, of course, storms on the way. If you are a supporter of Point North Media over on Patreon at patreon.com slash pointnorthmedia, which of course you are and should be because it's that support that allows me to make shows like this in the first place, then you can access our Discord channel where I have just created a whole new channel, a sub-channel over there on Discord for American Gods spoilers. So if you are familiar already with the book and want to talk about the adaptive choices being made by the TV show, there is a spoiler channel there where you can talk freely. And if you are not, there is a regular channel where you can kind of keep pace with the seminar as we move forward. Um, Yes, everything is good. Everything is working. Sarah says, no spoiler channel. No, but there is, there is, Sarah, right before I started this. There is now a spoiler channel over on Discord. And I have some people uh, on Discord, at least, right now. So if you are watching this via Discord, then you can get in touch and let me know what you think. And of course, I have my wonderful people right here in the YouTube chat. We have 18 people watching, which is pretty good, actually, for 4 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. So uh, 4 o'clock Eastern, I should say, on a Tuesday afternoon. Thank you guys all for being here. This is excellent. Speaking of interactivity, speaking of commentary, speaking of your brilliant insight and responses, I wanted to read pretty much in its entirety an email that I received yesterday from a listener named Brian. Brian absolutely puts his finger, I think, on one of the issues surrounding um, the the notion of roadside attraction as a holy place within the pages of American Gods. This is what Brian had to say. Um, he was talking about uh, there and back again first, and then says, this is really about American gods and your question about whether the roadside holy places idea rang, rang true. I'm trained as a political theorist and the American dream excuse me, and the American dream is something I've read about and taught for a few years. I've read Gaiman's point as follows. As far back as at least to Tocqueville, Europeans had been struck by the transient nature of the American soul, the way it is always in flux, never still, never satisfied, always moving on to the next thing. The journey more important than the destination, not because the journey is sacred, but because we lack the ability to slow down long enough to arrive at the end. We tire of stillness and get bored with satisfaction. There's a wonderful chapter in Democracy in America that still rings true in a powerful way 180 years later, but the journey should not be equated with the end. We want roots, but cannot stop ourselves from digging them up in a way that leaves us profoundly dissatisfied and not quite knowing who we are. And so while elsewhere in the world a holy place would be invested with permanence, with some sort of religious site or structure that would become the centerpiece of a community and a daily part of the lives of its members, it makes sense that in the United States these same holy sites would be marked by something that demands no further attention than a few casual moments along a journey that will never end. The recognition that Americans seek something holy but cannot find the stillness and quiet and permanence that would be needed to receive it. Brian, that is a magnificently composed email. I think you absolutely put your finger on it. I think that is a very powerful argument articulated within those thoughts. Um, I I guess I would frame that by saying that this is an element in American culture, in almost in, in almost in popular American culture, the idea that Americans have a sense of themselves as a transient people, a sense of themselves as as a mobile people, I guess to use perhaps a less uh, a less judgmental word. Um, I find that really interesting, but of course it it exists in opposition with the fact that the United States is a settled country. You know, people came here and did eventually stop. I think there is a restlessness in the American soul, but in, in and when I say the American soul, I'm talking about, you know, the American cultural identity, the 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 kind of um zeitgeist, the gestalt, I suppose, of all that is America encoded into the personality of each individual American. Um there is a restlessness there, but there is still a capacity for community and for home building and for for permanence. So I I think that this is uh, an incomplete descriptor of the American spirit, but it is certainly a valid and compelling descriptor of the American spirit. So thank you so much for that. I really like that idea. I really love this idea of of that kind of fleeting impermanence, that, that this is a holy site in this sense, is not the focus around which a community accretes, but is instead something that is experienced in a passing transitory fashion. That... Yeah, that's a really powerful idea. So thank you, Brian, so much for that. Um, Yeah, Kim Clark here says in the YouTube chat, I say not America per se, but those who are drawn to America create this place. Again, we have to distinguish between the United States and and America. The, The idea of the cultural identity of the United States and those who call it home, I think, there is a 
Mm. There is a, a kind of uh, cultural identity wrapped up with the notion of the United States as a nation that is distinct in some interesting ways, even from people who, you know, are citizens of that country, born and raised, people who have been here for their entire lives. I think that there are some subsets of the population of the geographical United States for whom the notion, the ideological notion, the almost you know theological notion of the United States is more or less important. So yes, yeah, certainly even this descriptor of, of the United States isn't going to be true for everyone who is here. Not least of all because, as has been observed many times, this is a nation of immigrants and remains so even to this day. Yeah. Um, and as Kate says right here in the YouTube chat, the U.S. is tied to the immigrant experience, so it's at odds with permanence and settlement. Yes, but for the observable phenomenon. You know, it's, I, I'm, I'm aware that this feels paradoxical even as I say it, but you're absolutely right. While we have this notion of American culture as being transient and mobile, this entire continent has been settled. This entire, you know, and, and again, when I say settled, that's not to imply that it wasn't settled. Previously, we're talking about the United States as a as a nation rather than as a, a, a geographical you know region in that that's but as Sarah Thomas says here, but there are holy places in America. They get dug up and built on. Uh, again, Sarah, the distinct uh, while I'm in complete agreement, the distinction that I would draw there is that those are not holy sites associated with the United States. They don't speak, didn't speak, don't speak to that identity, to that cultural phenomenon. That's obviously you know, enormously problematic and enormously, um, enormously shameful in many specific instances, but that's, that's the distinction there again. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Nash says Fuller in interviews has said that the message of the story feels altered with the administration change between production and release. Boy, I can only imagine, I can only imagine how a story that, that is predicated upon the necessity of, of immigration and the immigrant experience has been changed by recent political transformations here in the United States. Yes. Okay, let's move into our slides because as I said, I have got a fast 90 minute session and we must get all the way to the end of chapter six. And we're going to pick up with uh, basically the discussion that I promised at the end of the last session, which is the discussion of the fortune which Shadow gets from the mannequin fortune teller, uh, the mannequin fortune teller, excuse me, in the house in The Rock. Every ending is a new beginning. Your lucky number is none. Your lucky color is dead. Motto, like father, like son. And in a way, it's actually great that we get to circle back around to this discussion this week rather than last week, because this week we have one more very important information, uh, a very important piece of information when we're discussing that last line there, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Every ending is a new beginning. I think when we're and assuming that because fortunes are presented in this poetic and somewhat cryptic way, we are invited, I think, to speculate about deeper meaning. This isn't simply the case that that Shadow gets a slip of paper and it doesn't really have any, any direct applicability to his experience. We're kind of invested in the idea that fortunes, when presented within a work of fiction, like American Gods, carry with them a kind of thematic wait, that, that we the reader are being handed an additional perspective on what is happening here. And that's actually not entirely outside of the, the, the realm of possibility within the frame of American Gods, because we have Wednesday making remarks about the Norns and about weird and about, you know, this notion of destiny. So even within the text, Shadow is, is cued to look at this fortune as somewhat more important than a randomly generated slip of paper that comes from a fortune telling machine. And we, as readers, I think, are entitled to to come along with him on that. Uh, Jonathan Nash is calling out the spoiler channel on Discord. Uh, yeah, there are probably some discussions we can have over there. I don't know, a few handful, a handful of, of discussions we can have over there. Um, so a quick and dirty interpretation here. Every ending is a new beginning. And I did get, I should say, some emails about this, um, the kind of offering different interpretations. Uh, every ending is a new beginning. Everyone basically, basically parsed that as the death of Laura, Shadow's emergence from prison. I did get an interesting, uh, an interesting perspective on this that said that no, actually, Shadow's ending wasn't emerging from prison and the death of Laura. It was going to prison in the first place. Laura's death, Robbie's death, uh, Shadow's um, rootless, transient life in the post-Laura world is actually a consequence of of the inciting incident, if you like. So what happened was Shadow went to prison, 
that was the end of his life. Then he was in a, a purgatorial state for three years and has now emerged, now is, is re-entering the world, though doing so only inconsistently. So that, I think, is a really interesting perspective, too, but I, I'm not sure there's anything more to gain there. Your lucky number is none. Your lucky color is dead. Um, there is an interesting piece of interpretation that you can do, I think, with that third line. Your lucky color is dead. At the funeral, Audrey tells Shadow, or, or tells the reader by, by reminding Shadow, how much Laura loves violets. And it does feel as though there is a connection between Laura and color simply. So your lucky color is dead could simply be a reference to Laura. But more importantly, um, your lucky number is none, your lucky color is dead. The fortune here is refusing to engage with its own premise. It is setting up a frame and then refusing to fill that frame. This is uh, exactly the same thing as if I handed you, you, you come into a restaurant and I hand you a menu, a menu that is completely blank. Or worse still, I hand you a menu that has pictures of farmhouse dining tables on it, you know? I'm, I'm not just giving you no information. The fortune that Shadow gets from the machine isn't blank, but in the deliberate uh, making of a promise, in the establishment of a frame, and then the refusal to fill that frame, the absence of information is more stark, is more emphatic. Your lucky number is none. There are such things as lucky numbers. You don't get one. This renders Shadow somewhat outside of his context. He is unlike other people. He doesn't get to belong. He doesn't get to fit the normal conventions of human life to the extent that they include lucky numbers and lucky colors, I guess, don't apply to shadow. He is something different. And then we get the motto, like father, like son, which is fairly trite. And for those of us who had by this point already anticipated the reveal of Wednesday's identity, we could perhaps have drawn the same conclusion that I think a lot of people come to after you've read chapter six, which is, oh, okay, Wednesday is the old father. So to the degree that Shadow is working with Wednesday, like father, like the old father, like son, that, that Shadow is going to draw influence or be influenced by Wednesday in this regard. Um, Kate says zero is a none number. Yes, yes. I mean, that's true, but it doesn't say zero. Um, and that ambiguity, I think, increases the likelihood that it is a refusal to impart information rather than the, the ambiguous imparting of specific information. There is a difference between saying your lucky number is zero and your lucky number is none. You know, none can also represent the absence of a number, the, the absence of any kind of, of distinct information in this regard, in a way that saying your lucky number is zero, couldn't. So yeah, it's possible, yeah. As Becca says, Shadow doesn't have luck. He is at the mercy of other forces. Becca, I like that a great deal. I like that a great deal. Good. Okay, excellent. Um, so let's move on then. Um, and I want to discuss... Uh, hmm... I guess we'll do we'll do a quick gloss here of the drunkard's dream because we do want to pay attention to to dreams. So let's take a look at the drunkard the drunkard's dream. Excuse me. Put in the money, said Chernobog. Why? asked Shadow. You must see. I show you. Shadow inserted his coin. The drunk in the graveyard raised his bottle to his lips. One of the gravestones flipped over, revealing a grasping corpse. A headstone turned around, flowers replaced by a grinning skull. A wraith appeared on the right of the church, while on the left of the church something with a half-glimpsed, pointed, unsettlingly bird-like face, a pale, Boschian nightmare, glided smoothly from a headstone into the shadows and was gone. Then the church door opened, a priest came out, and the ghosts, haunts, and corpses vanished, and only the priest and the drunk were left alone in the graveyard. The priest looked down at the drunk disdainfully and backed through the open door, which closed behind him, leaving the drunk on his own. The clockwork story was deeply unsettling, much more unsettling, thought Shadow, than clockwork has any right to be. You know why I show this to you? asked Chernobog. No. That is the world as it is. That is the real world. It is there, in that box. Chernobog, very helpfully here, giving us a pretty direct 
thematic statement, a pretty direct frame through which we can, or a lens through which we can understand uh, at least imperfectly Shadow's experience. As Jonathan says in the YouTube chat, in vino veritas. Yes, the idea that by losing one's self, even by unleashing one's more animalistic nature, we can glimpse momentarily truth, only for that truth to vanish when we are restored to normality. And it's interesting to start today's discussion with the email from Brian about holy places, because I think that one of the things that the priest represents in the drunkard's dream is not simply religion, not simply faith, not simply holiness, but also a kind of consensuality, a kind of social consensuality that the priest represents the coming together of the community to create a kind of order that is antithetical to this world of evil and spirits. Um, I would also draw your attention to the, uh, what is that, the fourth sentence, I guess, in that third, fourth paragraph there. A wraith appeared on the right of the church, while on the left of the church, something with a half-glimpsed, pointed, unsettlingly bird-like face, a pale, boshy, and nightmare glided smoothly from a headstone into the shadows and was gone. That's one of those Gaiman sentences. That's one of those Gaiman sentences where we elevate and elevate and elevate the language. It's also, potentially at least, another bird reference for those of us who are keeping track of those. So what happens here? Well, I don't think we have to look too far to assert that Shadow is beginning to see things which are, as Chernobog asserts, true, that he is seeing through the veil of mundanity into a realm that is far stranger and more unsettling than he could have expected. I'm, I guess my question, I guess my, my point of curiosity about the drunkard's dream here is the presence of the priest and the way that that mundanity is reasserted, that these haunts and spirits and specters disappear. And there isn't, I think, particularly in the recounting that we're given, there isn't a sense in which they were never there. Clearly, we're supposed to believe, thanks to, in part to the fact that Shadow is unsettled by it, that these things are true. They are just absent in the presence of the priest, not, not you know, rendered fictional. So that's something to bear in mind as we move forward. Is there a presence or a force or an element that is pushing back on Shadow's experience? Is there something in Shadow's life that is reasserting that mundanity? Is Shadow himself seeking to reassert that mundanity? Is Shadow the drunkard? Is Shadow the priest? Is Shadow both? Is Shadow neither? These are the questions that we must consider because of the way that the text has already instructed us as to the the power and thematic and symbolic import of dreams and dreaming. Yeah. Um, let me see here. <laughs> Casey says, no one expects you catastrophe. It's like the Spanish Inquisition. If you weren't expecting me to use the word you catastrophe in today's Storms on the Way lecture, then perhaps you weren't prepared for the drinking game. It's probably for the best. Um, excellent. Okay. Good. All right, let's push ahead to the uh, to the carousel. Jonathan says, before we get to the carousel, I think the priest is supposed to be drawing the belief of the world around them, hiding the monsters that are still there, which, if true, Jonathan, hmm, what is the functional power of belief? We have, by this point, already been given a few perspectives on belief. We've already been given a few perspectives on belief as a functional, mechanical part of stories and storytelling. What is the function of belief? What can belief actually achieve? Because it's interesting that we have a priest and not a god. We don't have, you know, clockwork clouds parting and a, a ray of sunlight shining down upon the graveyard and that banishing the, these specters and ghouls. Rather, it's the presence of a mortal man. A mortal man presumably imbued with a great deal of belief, a great deal of faith. But are we suggesting here that faith can somehow protect us from the dangers of the night? Well, no, that isn't consistent with what we've seen from American gods so far. In fact, belief in dangerous forces makes the world more dangerous. That seems to be pretty much a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, so what does the priest represent here? What What is the priest telling us here? Hmm. 
there are a few interesting interpretations, um, which I guess we can circle back around to after the end of chapter six, because we're going to see really the application of the priest, I suppose, in uh, Shadow's encounter with the spooks. So we can we can get ahead to that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. All right. So let's move ahead to the carousel here. Two slides on the carousel. <laughs> and then there was the carousel. A sign proclaimed it was the largest in the world, said how much it weighed, how many thousand light bulbs were to be found in the chandeliers that hung from it in gothic profusion and forbade anyone from climbing on it or from riding on the animals. And such animals. Shadow stared, impressed in spite of himself, at the hundreds of full-sized creatures who circled on the platform of the carousel. Real creatures, imaginary creatures, and transformations of the two. Each creature was different. He saw mermaid and merman, centaur and unicorn, elephants, one huge, one tiny, bulldog, frog and phoenix, zebra, tiger, manticore and basilisk, swans pulling a carriage, a white ox, a fox, twin walruses, even a sea serpent, all of them brightly colored and more than real. Each rode the platform as the waltz came to an end and a new waltz began. The carousel did not even slow down. What's it for? asked Shadow. I mean, okay, world's biggest, hundreds of animals, thousands of light bulbs, and it goes around all the time, but no one ever rides it. It's not there to be ridden, not by people, said Wednesday. It's there to be admired. It's there to be. Honestly, we could spend an entire hour and a half, I suspect, just talking about this excerpt, because there is so much here. We're going to try to limit ourselves, I suppose, to a couple of primary observations. Um, the first is that the, the profusion of creatures here, real creatures, imaginary creatures, and transformations of the two. So here we're presented with the mundane world, the fantastical world, and points of interface between them. Ways in which individual creatures upon the carousel amidst the profusion of both real and imaginary creatures can inhabit both worlds or be inhabited by both worlds or be defined by both worlds. We get both the real and the unreal and both. And that is obviously as we move into chapter six, completely crucial. The part that I like most here comes right there at the end of that third paragraph. All of them brightly colored and more than real. We talked a little about this as we were discussing roadside attractions, and I certainly talked about this a little when I was discussing the first episode of the TV show with Daphne and Elizabeth. The idea of the roadside attraction as a hyper-real representation of something that is true, a gaudy, plastic, twinkling, Christmas light bedecked version of its real self, is here echoed in, replicated by the carousel itself. It's a fascinating perspective on representation, symbolism, and creativity itself. We're not here trying to make something real. We're trying to make something that is so very much more than real that it takes on a kind of reality itself. Again, we're, we're, we're kind of orbiting here the idea of, of belief. We make this thing so exaggerated but that you can't help but be enchanted by it, can't help but be engaged by it, can't help but, therefore, imbue it with some of your faith, some of your belief. And then we get the exchange between Shadow and Wednesday, which sums up, in part, I think Wednesday's perspective on mortals and belief and faith and the existence of gods, it's not there to be ridden, not by people, said Wednesday. It's there to be admired. It's there to be. It is not there for the entertainment, or even if we strip away entertainment and we move to, to more abstract language, it is not there to fulfill a function. It is not there to to be mechanistic in that sense, and certainly not, as Wednesday says specifically, not by people. It does not exist to serve a purpose. It exists to exist. It is there to be admired. It is there to be worshipped. It is there to be believed in. These are the gods. And it is arguable, particularly given our discussion of uh, the House on the Rock and, and roadside attractions in general during last week's session, it is arguable that the carousel is kind of a god inside the House on the Rock. That this is, it is uh, not a god in the 
divine sense or even in the supernatural sense and certainly not in the performative sense it would seem but in the sense of being a repository of power in which belief is invested that seems to me to work pretty well for the carousel so the carousel innately exists between worlds it, it like the the quasar real fantastical but not imaginary animals that we see uh on the carousel itself the carousel itself is a being of that sort is both mundane and divine is both natural and supernatural it it provides a perfect bridge here into the events of chapter six um let me see as we move in here. Um, <laughs> Tom has dropped in to say, I haven't started the show or book, but never catch a live show. Just stop by to say hello. Hello, Tom. Very glad to have you. Go buy the book. I mean, the book. I'm not just chiding Tom. He does say he's going to go buy the book. Um, yes. Good. Good. Exactly. As Kate says, the eagle tiger doesn't exist in myth, but it does on the carousel on, in the house on the rock. Yes. Good. Um, Yes, we have an interesting, um, yeah, we're having a discussion here about Shadow's, uh, Shadow's knowledge here, Shadow's frame of reference. Uh, as Jonathan says, Shadow sure knows a lot of fantastical animals for not knowing the gods. Um, yes, because, and, and uh, as Princess Ostrich here says, he, he read Herodotus, um, Manticore, Basilisk, and Phoenix, says Jonathan, are those... You know, it is possible that one of the books Shadow read while he was in prison was the D&D &D Monster Manual, um, I which I think would account for just, just a lot of this. Um, I know that my knowledge of mythological creatures is taken almost entirely from that book, which I read when I was about 13. Um, yes. Yes. Good. Okay. And as Gene says, um, I feel the Manticore is the most obscure, but others believably recognizable. Note he doesn't have a name for the tiger eagle he rides. Yes, that's fair. That's fair. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, Lauren says, the eagle tiger does seem to be in the same taxonomy as a hippogriff, though. Yes, possibly. Um, possibly a griffin, um, depending on, like, the version of the fantastical world that you're referring to. Because, of course, these fantastical legendary creatures do have established traits and qualities, but then a new fantasy writer will come along and create something slightly different, but use the same word, or, you yeah. know. Fantasy is is just you know endlessly recycling these same core concepts. Yeah, good. Um, uh, Princess Ostrich says it's like the medieval bestiaries where it's one third real animals, one third mystical beings, and one third whatever the fuck the author wanted to chip in. Yes, it could well be. <laughs> um, Aaron says, we don't learn about Shadow's childhood for a while, but as a very minor spoiler, I think he was dorky enough to have played D&D &D as a kid. You don't have to be dorky to play D&D, &D, Aaron, said the man hosting a live session on the pod, uh, on the internet talking about a book. Um, okay, let's move on because, yes, good, no, I'm a half hour in. I'm right on schedule, you guys. This is going to work out perfectly. Certainly nothing will derail the rest of the conversation. This is the very last excerpt from Chapter 5. Shadow inspected a bulldog and a myrrh creature and an elephant with a golden howdah, and then he climbed on the back of a creature with an eagle's head and the body of a tiger and held on tight. The rhythm of the blue Danube waltz rippled and rang and sang in his head. The lights of a thousand chandeliers glinted and prismed, and for a heartbeat, Shadow was a child again, and all it took to make him happy was to ride the carousel. He stayed perfectly still, riding his eagle tiger at the center of everything, and the world revolved around him. Shadow heard himself laugh over the sound of the music. He was happy. It was as if the last 36 hours had never happened, as if the last three years had not happened, as if his life had evaporated into the daydream of a small child riding the carousel at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco on his first trip back to the States, a marathon journey by ship and by car, his mother standing there, watching him proudly, and himself sucking his melting popsicle, holding on tightly, hoping that the music would never stop, the carousel would never slow, the ride would never end, he was going around and around and around again. Then the lights went out, and Shadow saw the gods. I'm sure that uh, following our discussions of Gaiman's elevating tone in these descriptions, that you all followed the procession here, that from Shadow heard himself laugh over the sound of the music, we get bigger and bigger and bigger. What we get, he was happy, which is a typical Shadow Moon line, you know, Shadow said nothing. We get this very short encapsulation of his experience, and then more and more grandiose. Higher and higher levels of oratory, higher and higher levels of rhetoric, more and more 
imagery and, and stream of consciousness flow here. And then that hard crash, then the lights went out and Shadow saw the gods. So why does the carousel affect Shadow the way that it does? What does it mean to him? Is it simply a, a, an echo of a childhood memory? Is it simply something fun? It doesn't seem as though Shadow's done a lot of terribly fun things in his adult life, possibly even prior to his adult life. What are we supposed to make of the ability of the, the carousel to emotionally transform Shadow? Well, of course, given what happens next, it is very tempting to attribute to the carousel a kind of magic, a kind of unreality, a kind of presence in another realm, presence in a more supernatural realm, that there is actually some enchantment woven about the carousel, possibly by simply the investment of belief. I mentioned earlier the idea that the carousel is kind of, in its way, an inanimate god. That is, it fulfills all the functions of a god, at least as far as we understand them to this point. It is there to be adored. It has absorbed the belief of every kid who has stared at it wide-eyed and believed that must be the most fun thing in the world. And maybe if enough children believe that hard enough for long enough, it becomes the most fun thing in the world. It's possible. We could be looking at a kind of a kind of return on invested belief, I suppose, that Shadow is, is kind of making good on everyone who has looked at the carousel and never ridden it. I should say, by the way, that in real life, the carousel does exist, and in real life, you are not allowed to ride the carousel unless you are Neil Gaiman. Because Neil Gaiman apparently goes to the House on the Rock all the time and is allowed to ride the carousel. If you feel a little jealousy over that, and you should, then I encourage you to tweet at Neil himself and just tell him that, that at the very least he can take like an Instagram thing. You know, he can, he can periscope a little video of, of the carousel, maybe do that thing. That would be great. Um, let me see here. Uh, Vivian's calling out, yes, on his first trip back to the States. <gasps> Did we just get backstory? Did we just get a hint at the shape of Shadow's childhood? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Angela's looking at a more uh, psychological explanation here, which is simply that it brings out his innocence and his freedom to believe. I actually like that too. It, we needn't We needn't look for a magical explanation of the carousel, but given that we are already, I think, prompted to see it in, in supernatural, if not outright magical terms, the, and, and certainly given that it's about to have a profound effect, writing the carousel at least is about to have a profound effect on Shadow, I'm inspired and inclined to look at it in those terms, but I do think it's also possible just to take this as a moment of, of simple, childlike fun that we see here. Shadow is cast back into his memory, that he is, is recalling earlier, happier experiences before the world became the burden that it is to Shadow Moon. Good. Um, yeah. Oh, Casey says something interesting here. Um, oh, and the YouTube chat just updated. So um, let me see here. Wow, Casey says, I just realized I don't think this is a story of Shadow's personal childhood. Interesting, Casey. Huh. Is this a different coming to America dream? Possibly. We will have to, um, yes, we'll have to track what we know and what we are told and what we believe about Shadow's backstory as we move through it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, as Gene says, a friend of mine upon watching the show was left with the biggest worry after the change to Tech Boy. What will this do to the effect of the carousel as opening up Shadow's willingness to believe? Yes, um, we're definitely doing the carousel in the show. Uh, the consequence of the carousel mechanically must be broadly the same. I can't imagine they would change that very wildly, but you're absolutely right that the perspective on the perspective on Shadow's own personal belief and own personal engagement in the unfolding narrative is going to be very different, though that is almost inevitable. Um, that's almost inevitably going to be a function of, of the adaptation into a visual form because we can imagine more naturalistic versions of fantastical events. Um, but when you have to show those things, when you have to to demonstrate whether it's it's technical boy or it's the coming storm or it's you know coin tricks or it's um, the zodiac pulling the moon from the sky and transforming it into into a, a silver liberty dollar, 
all of these things, we can interpret them in this magical realist sense within the, the bounds of the book. But when you actually have to show those things on screen and make them work, make them visually compelling, I think it is harder to maintain that kind of ambiguity. But yes, I think that's... <laughs> We're not loving Tech Boy, it turns out. We're not loving his, uh, his presence in the adaptation. That's very fair. Um, yeah, yeah. Lauren says, considering the House on the Rock tourism that must come from this novel, and Jonathan says, they're going to see a flood over the next couple of months. Um, yes, including probably me. It's entirely possible that, um, I guess what, maybe a little over a month from now, I'll be able to take a couple of days up in Wisconsin, and one of the things that I will be doing will definitely be visiting the House on the Rock. And as I've said before, if that trip should take place, I will let you all know via Twitter and via the podcast too, uh, when and where and how that is happening so that anyone who's in or around Wisconsin can come visit with us and we can go do a quick tour and maybe I'll do a little, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll do a little impromptu lecture or something on, on the significance of the House on the Rock um, as it's associated with American Gods. I think that'd be fun, right? Um, yeah, so stay tuned for more information about that. Yes, okay. Um, Let's let's move on then, because Shadow saw the gods, and we are getting into chapter six. There are a few things here which I haven't pulled out for slides, which um, I kind of want to talk about, but there are a couple of things that I would rather talk about in the context of later events and... While I would love to do a close textual read of Mr. Nancy's story, um, I don't think that it really serves the narrative here, and that would be a long discussion. So uh, in the interest of efficiency, I'm going to cut that, but hopefully we'll get everything else that we want here. Um, Casey asks, okay, but what about a group outing to rob a Chicago bank? Not rob the bank, Casey, just con some people out of some money that they were aiming to deposit in the bank. Right? Okay. This is our first slide from Chapter 6. The only light was starlight, but it illuminated everything with a cold clarity. Beneath him, his mount stretched and padded, its warm fur under, its left, under his left hand, its feathers beneath his right. It's a good ride, isn't it? The voice came from behind him, in its ears and in his mind. Shadow turned slowly, streaming images of himself as he moved, frozen moments, each him captured in a fraction of a second, every tiny movement lasting for an infinite period. The images that reached his mind made no sense. It was like seeing the world through the multifaceted, jeweled eyes of a dragonfly, but each facet saw something completely different, and he was unable to combine the things he was seeing or thought he was seeing into a whole that made any sense. This, um, this prigma prismatic, fragmentary quality to Shadow's experience of of this realm, of the inside of Wednesday's mind, perhaps of some otherworldly divine realm, perhaps of myth, of story, of fairy, wherever it is that Shadow is right now, whatever it is that he's experiencing, one of the most notable things is this prismatic quality, is this idea that the rules of time and space and, and logical fluid consistency are suspended here that this is a place, uh, a world, a universe that functions according to very different rules. And even now, oh, as Becca says here in the YouTube chat, this reminds me of Funhouse Mirrors. Yes, there is still a sense that it is, that there is something of the carnival. There is something of the, the roadside attraction that is made hyper-realistic. This is reality dialed up in exactly the same way that roadside attractions are oftentimes reality dialed up. Casey says, loving this fragmented sort of omniscience. Absolutely. Oh, and Lauren calls that Nancy was amazing and the reader in the full cast audiobook is wow. Yeah, part of the reason that I don't really want to talk about Mr. Nancy is just because there's so much to say. There's so much good to say and we'll get our chance. We'll, we'll get our opportunity to talk about him. Yes. Um, okay. So this is really just to frame the rest of our experience, because what we're going to get through the rest of this chapter, or through the first part of this chapter, um, is an account of Shadow's experience. But what we must remember is that Shadow's experience is not his usual experience. So we are almost invited by the, the emphatic imprecision of Shadow's experience here to question his account, to wonder what it is that he's seeing as we're getting this, this 
narrated version of, of Shadow's experience. So let's move on to the reveal. You guys, we've been waiting for this. This is episode six of Storms on the Way, and I know that some of you jumped there right from the, right from the very beginning, even those of you who are reading the book for the first time, but it turns out that Wednesday isn't his only name. Let's take a look at this slide. Do you know me, Shadow, said Wednesday. He rode his wolf with his head high. His right eye glittered and flashed. His left eye was dull. He wore a cloak with a deep monk-like cowl, and his face stared out at them from the shadows. I told you I would tell you my names. This is what they call me. I am called Glad of War, Grim, Raider, and Third. I am one-eyed. I am called Highest and True Guesser. I am Grimnir, and I am the Hooded One. I am All Father and I am Gondlier Windbearer, Wandbearer, excuse me. I have as many names as there are winds, as many titles as there are ways to die. My ravens are Hugin and Munin, thought and memory. My wolves are Freki and Giri. My horse is the gallows. Two ghostly gray ravens, like transparent skins of birds, landed on Wednesday's shoulders, pushed their beaks into the side of Wednesday's head as if tasting his mind, and flapped out into the world once more. What should I believe? thought Shadow, and the voice came back to him from somewhere deep beneath the world in a bass rumble. Believe everything. Odin, said Shadow, and the wind whipped the word from his lips. Odin, whispered Wednesday, and the crash of the breakers on the beach of skulls was not loud enough to drown that whisper. Odin, said Wednesday, tasting the sound of the words in his mouth. Odin, said Wednesday, his voice a triumphant shout that echoed from horizon to horizon. His name swelled and grew and filled the world like the pounding of blood in Shadow's ears. As Princess Ostrich says, this is but a fragment of all his names. Yes, this would last a lot longer if we tried. Uh, impossibly, I'm sure to list all the many names of Odin, the Allfather. Um, even knowing that this reveal is coming, um, and I must confess that the first time that I had read the book, I did jump this this reveal just a little. I, I had kind of figured it out, or at least guessed that this was the case before I got here, and that does nothing to drain this reveal of its emotional import, because we are here profoundly connected to Shadow. It is a moment of, of absolute revelation and giving Wednesday, giving Odin the speech, giving him the reveal, and then giving him his own name. And we can't skip over the fact that his, his repetition of his own name is itself a three beat, the whisper, the word, the shout. All of these elements conspire to make the reveal suitably epic, suitably mythic, even if you've already anticipated it, even if you already have a sense. Gene says, for how early the reveal is, this one I think is meant to be a bit more obvious from the start. Um, yes, I think that's fair. I don't think that Gaiman is, is intending to be particularly coy. Um, certainly the TV show is being even less coy with, uh, with the secret of Wednesday's identity. We are all but invited to speculate about his identity, and we are all but invited to assume that he is Odin. You don't have to be terribly, terribly well-versed in Norse mythology to come to that conclusion. And as I said, in, in earlier versions of the book, it's even more obvious because we basically get the name Odin right there. Yeah. Um... Good, good. As the buffalo says, says Jonathan, believe. Doesn't matter what, just believe. <laughs> yes, Gene says, let's continue the trend of what we're seminaring. Names, they're important. Yes, they are. The Particularly because, of course, um, the, the faceted identity of Odin, the faceted identity of all gods, is, I think, in part connected with the faceted nature of reality here within Wednesday's mind. That as as Shadow is seeing this fractured, kaleidoscopic, prismatic version of, well, not reality, I guess, but, but, but version of what is literally before him or figuratively before him or however we're supposed to understand his presence in this place, 
as Shadow is experiencing this, this fragmentary version, so the gods themselves are fragmentary. And there was a really interesting email that I received from, let me double check this, from Jason. And this was really just speculation, a, a point of, of, of curiosity, I suppose, because gods don't have single unified identities. You can worship Odin as the All Father. You can worship him as as the the Wand Bearer, as the True Guesser, as the the Glad of War. All of those things are Odin, certainly, but they are different aspects of Odin. And the question that I got, and and I just don't know how to even begin answering this, is what happens to a god wherein one element is forgotten? What happens to Odin if people forget that he was once uh, the Hooded One? Does he just lose his Hood? Is he transformed by this? Or is there an internal kind of cohesion to identity for gods? Can they themselves preserve elements of themselves? Is it possible that if Odin is only ever remembered as the one-eyed god, will the other elements that define his nature remain true because there's enough power flowing to one facet of his personality that, that the others remain alive and remain constant? Or will they, having been forgotten, be forgotten? Will they die in the way that a forgotten idea dies? Yeah. Yeah, good. Excellent. Uh, yes. Oh, oh, we're talking about the names of, uh, yes, the names of um, Odin's wolves mean, uh, yes, I believe, I'm not 100% sure of the translation, but uh, as Aaron says here, they mean hungry and greedy. Uh, <laughs> to which Casey replies, Odin named both of his wolves hungry. Okay, Odin. Odin invented the dad joke. I like that. And Becca says, he used to put the good names on himself. Yes. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, and, and Lauren's jumping ahead a, a little bit here. Yes, uh, it seems like Kali said a hint at that. At least she implied that there's a different Kali, possibly, possibly with slightly different aspects in India versus America. Yes, this is another point of, of speculation. Um, when... When, as we saw, uh, Odin and Tyr and Thor were brought to the shores of America, were new versions of these gods created? Are they geographically bound in that sense? Or is the scope of their omnipresence simply expanded? Well, we'll get into some specific discussion of that a little later. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, and Michael asks, conversely, would gods taking on new fragments or power, uh, would gods take on new fragments or powers if belief in new aspects was invested? If that were true, Michael, wouldn't the gods themselves, I mean, Wednesday in particular, wouldn't he be touring the world telling people stories of Odin? Wouldn't he be going from place to place saying Odin was great? And by the way, he could also just magically generate whiskey. That was one of his powers. No, no, no. People don't talk about it, but that was a thing that Odin could do. He could just snap his fingers and there would be a glass of whiskey. Wouldn't that be something that he would lean on a little bit? I mean, I don't know if he would manifest that actual power, but maybe, maybe. Um, good. All right. Oh, uh, Peter is here saying, late to the feed. Did anyone else think of Field of Dreams when discussing roadside attractions? Certainly when discussing the House on the Rock last time, Peter. Yes. Uh, if you build it, they will come. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> good. Um, uh, Becca asks, how has Kali not gotten a comic book or a movie deal in the US? And Aaron replies, because Scarlett Johansson has a busy docket. Fair. Fair. Okay. So we have this uh, this reveal of identity, of course, and we also, we, we mustn't overlook the voice of the bison from Shadow's Dream. Believe this resonant and 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 almost harmonic you know sound that that reverberates through this chapter believe this is going to be very important later but we must move on to our discussion of well why we're all gathered here today this is wednesday's speech you know me he said you all know me some of you have no cause to love me and i'm not sure i can blame you for that but love me or not you know me. There was a rustling, a stir among the people on the benches. I've been here longer than most of you. Like the rest of you, I figured we could get by on what we got. Not enough to make us happy, but enough to keep going. That may not be the case anymore. There's a storm coming, and it's not a storm of our making. He paused. Now he stepped forward and folded his arms across his chest. When the people came to America, they brought us with them. 
They brought me and Loki and Thor, Anansi and the Lion God, Leprechauns and Clorokans and Banshees, Kubera and Frau Holla and Ashtaroth, and they brought you. We rode here in their minds and we took root. We traveled with the settlers to the new lands across the ocean. The land is vast. Soon enough, our people abandoned us, remembered us only as creatures of the old land, as things that had not come with them to the new. Our true believers passed on or stopped believing, and we were left, lost and scared and dispossessed, to get by on what little smidgens of worship or belief we could find, and to get by as best we could. So that's what we've done, gotten by, out on the edges of things where no one was watching us too closely. We have, let us face it and admit it, little influence. We prey on them, and we take from them, and we get by. We strip, and we whore, and we drink too much. We pump gas, and we steal, and we cheat, and we exist in the cracks at the edges of society. Old gods, here in this new land, without gods. It is interesting to think of the to think of the fractured nature of these gods themselves, that there is no real reason, presumably, if, if Odin is capable of responding to all believers of all belief, that he should be separated from the old world, that he should recognize any kind of discontinuity at all between the new world and the old, except, of course, that the belief in him is almost a function of a belief in the new world that the immigrant story is always one that is at one remove from its root. That even if an immigrant brings to their new home a sense of their culture, a, a conscious and deliberate sense of their culture and their heritage and their context, and seeks to the limits of their ability to replicate that culture and society, that, that, that sense of community. If they seek to build a new version of their home, you cannot ever avoid the fact that it is a new version. There is an inherent and, and necessary discontinuity in that experience. One of the things that I find most interesting about this discussion, one of the things that I find most interesting about the mechanics of belief and, and particularly the, the bringing with of gods and then the, the loss of those gods, is simply that within every story told of Odin here in the new world, there is a sense of the absence of the old world, of every god which has been brought to America. There is an obvious and implicit understanding that this god is now distinct from the other old god. I would be fascinated to see how that played out in, in hmm, let me be careful here. <laughs> I would be fascinated to see that, how, fascinated to see how that would play out in a more kind of structurally rigorous form, you know, in a, a if it were composed as outright Theology. I would be interested to to read that. Yeah, um, yeah. Princess Elstrich is saying Frau Holle. Uh, that's more fairy tale than myth. I would have expected something from Siegfried and the Siegfried the Dragon Slayer or the Earl King or something. Yeah. Again, as Jonathan says here, fairy tales are myths at a different scale. Leprechauns are fairy taleish too. Yes. Um, exactly what constitutes a god seems to simply be that thing in which belief is invested. Um, Clearly, we have leprechauns, we have, you know, uh, the fairy folk, and certainly as we move into the tension between the old gods and the new, we see even less kind of, of formal distinction around what is and is not a god. Um, this meeting, this gathering, the way that certain gods are named and, and uh, attributed power suggests that, to a certain extent, being a god is a function of being a god. That, <laughs> that if tales are told of you as a god, then you inhabit that space as opposed to the others. Yeah. Uh, Becca says, different fruits from the same tree. Yeah, good. All right. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, so we have here basically our introduction to the conflict that is going to drive the rest of the story, this conflict between the old gods and the new. We were brought here, we have survived on the fringes of society, and of course, 
it's almost too obvious to call out here uh the the reference the the applicability of this is almost too you know powerful and compelling to, to call out specifically but of course Odin is given a version of the immigrant experience, that he has come to this new place, but unable to naturalize himself completely, has been left in the cracks, has been left in a life of petty crime and disenfranchisement. That's the key term here, I think. That has happened through the ages to immigrant communities um, in every nation on earth. The idea that you can come here, but not be of here. Now, obviously, there are innumerable immigrant communities and, and individuals who have absolutely created a, a rich and, and rewarding kind of hybridized identity between their native identity and their new identity. That's the dream of, of immigration. But that's, I mean, the dream of social mobility and fluidity, regardless of actual, you know, lines of nationhood. Um, that's a powerful thing, that, that with each new experience, we become broader, but we integrate with that new experience. That is true whether you are coming from the old world to the new or whether you are, you know, moving to a new neighborhood or a new city or a new state. You can just, you know, if you move from here in the Midwest, for example, to Northern California, you're going to have a very different experience. It's not just about the nation. It's, it's, about, it's about context. So it is possible, certainly, it is common for, for immigrant populations to have that kind of integrative experience where the good of the old is preserved and integrated with the good of the new and something beautiful and, and, and unique is created in that, in, that, in that integration. But integration, obviously, also sometimes falters. And what's fascinating is that the gods themselves have had that failure of integration. They have not become naturalized. They have not become Americanized. They have always been on the fringes. And that disenfranchisement, that, that creeping lack of, or, or creeping disempowerment, I suppose, certainly seems to be true to fragments, to, to, to particular elements within various immigrant communities, both in this country and in, as I said, basically every other country on earth. So it's fascinating that the gods themselves are having that, uh, that response. Um, but much more importantly, here we get the frame of the conflict. The old gods are losing power. They are becoming forgotten. They are becoming less and less important. That was happening anyway, but now a storm is coming. Now a war is being declared. Now the old gods are being actively fought, actively purged almost. So we'll basically explore that through the rest of the book. Um, good, let me see here. Um, yes, excellent, excellent, excellent. And it's just a little after four local time. We're making great, great progress. <laughs> so we get a um, we get the meeting, and then we transition back. We come back to the mundane world, and Wednesday is there with a group of tourists, and we're all going out to eat. And this is where we're going to seal the deal, as Wednesday mentioned earlier. He needs a lot of money to 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 impress and to host these people so that he can get them on board, so that he can get them on his side. Shadow uh, drives back too, and we get this brief scene here. The man in the back seat, not the peculiar looking man, young man, the other one, said something, and Shadow replied to him. But a moment later, he was damned if he could remember what, he, what had been said. The peculiar looking young man had said nothing, but now he started to hum to himself a deep, melodic bass humming that made the interior of the car vibrate and rattle and buzz. The peculiar-looking man was of average height, but of an odd shape. Shadow had heard of men who were barrel-chested before, but had no image to accompany the metaphor. This man was barrel-chested, and he had legs like, yes, like tree trunks, and hands like exactly ham hocks. He wore a black parka with a hood, several sweaters, thick dungarees and incongruously in the winter, and with all these clothes, a pair of white tennis shoes, which were the same size and shape as shoeboxes. His fingers resembled sausages with flat, squared-off fingertips. That's some hum you got, said Shadow from the driver's seat. Sorry, said the particular young man in a deep, deep voice, embarrassed. He stopped humming. No, I enjoyed it said Shadow. Don't stop. The young man with the very literal description, which I completely adore, is, uh, is uh, referred to by Shadow as Elvis. Of course, his name is not Elvis. His name is Olvis. This is going to be 
a character who is a little more significant later, so we'll, we'll leave it for right now, but uh, this is a great character introduction. The reason that I pulled this slide, though, is because it speaks to one of the, God, enduring mysteries about this entire book. The man in the back seat, not the peculiar looking young man, the other one, said something and Shadow replied to him, but a moment later he was damned if he could remember what had been said. Who is this person? Who is this, I mean, presumably, God? This is a point of huge and rampant speculation. It isn't at all clear who this character is supposed to be. We're told later that he leaves with nothing but the sense of money. We get some incidental details which are suggestive, and I encourage you to go and look this up online. Go do some research and follow some of the discussions, because Okay, cards on the table. I think, having read some of Gaiman's other work, particularly, of course, Sandman, I think that this is a character that Gaiman has created. I don't think that this is necessarily rooted in a real god at all. I think the idea of a god who cannot be remembered, but that is like almost a, uh, a metaphorical part of his power set, that in his inability to be remembered, we will talk of the one who cannot be remembered and thus imbue him with belief nonetheless. That is such a Gaiman idea, I just adore it. But if you go and you look and you do the research, you can start to track certain things which may be suggestive. There are certain gods to whom the, the unknown god, or the, the unremembered god, I suppose, bears some similarity to. I, I, I think I am most... <sighs> I think I'm almost most convinced that he is representative somehow of a version of Mercury, except, of course, that Mercury has an identity. So I'm not sure exactly where I am. It's the silence, right, says Kate. Kate, that is exactly what I was thinking. It is, it is mythological in a very Doctor Who kind of sense. It is absolutely the silence. When you look away from them, you can no longer remember them. But when you are experiencing them, they are there and, and powerful and, and compelling. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> Jean says, the who? Just kidding, bad joke I never get tired of. Yes, yes. And Aaron says, I like No Name Guy. He seems to be added to confound us of our meta knowledge. That's really good. Uh, Michael says, is he a version of the Slender Man? Yes, I, I, there is within modern culture, uh, within modern urban horror, urban folklore culture, uh, an entire kind of... of subset of creatures that behave like the silence, that behave like the Slender Man. And obviously, I mean, there's a trivial comparison to be made between the silence and the Slender Man. The silence, I should say, from Doctor Who, if you haven't seen Doctor Who, the Slender Man from, hey, you know, the internet. Um, that archetype is so powerful and so compelling. Interestingly, was not so powerful or compelling in 2000 when Neil Gaiman wrote this novel, but was already, I think, kind of deep in our subconscious. The idea of of something which is important but cannot be remembered that is as i said just a super neil gaiman idea so i'm i'm kind of in love with it but i definitely encourage you all for those of you who are per, who are particularly interested in mythology for those of you who are let me cancel the slide which is still on there for some reason now you've forgotten what i look like and whether i existed or not um i encourage all of you who are particularly interested in mythology to go and and just go google who is the unknown or unremembered god in in american gods and and go follow some of those discussions because there's some great and insightful both analysis and research done to kind of move toward this conclusion um yes and and of course angela says yes he intrigues me i wonder what he said to shadow and what shadow's reply was yes Yes. Good. Um, yeah, The Stranger in Westeros. Yes. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, Lauren says, I'm reminded of the pagan temples that had a shrine to an unknown god that St. Paul equates with Christ. And and uh, Jean says in response, yes, a very common pull in contemporary epic fantasy too. Yes, the unknown god, the nameless god, the unremembered god, these are... Yes, this is very common now. Oh, hmm. Perhaps not common, but but not rare either. It's a very powerful idea in contemporary fantasy. So yes, good, good. Oh, Raquel is leaving us. She has to go and work on her dissertation. The God of Academia does not share well, and I don't want to incur its bitter wrath. <laughs> thank you for the lovely break, everyone. Raquel, thank you so much for joining us, and good luck with your dissertation. We shall all pray to the God of Academia for you. Offerings of coffee, I suppose. That's certainly how I always appeased that particular 
bitter god when I was working in an academic context. Um, so let's leave this behind for now. We'll we'll pick up with all this later in the book. Minor spoiler, I suppose. Uh, we then get where we're going, and and Shadow is immediately accosted by some unknown figures. He is captured, bound, and wakes in a room. Um, this is really interesting. Chesley Smith says, because of the high consumption of media today, many people experiencing emotion evoking things like books and shows, but forget many details. Could this be where the silence idea comes from? Hmm. Chesley, that's fascinating. That's genuinely fascinating. I'm thinking this through now, as you can tell by my halting mode of speech. Um, that's really interesting. Yes, possibly, possibly. I think that I would maybe... Yeah, I would maybe disassociate it a little from, from media and, and broaden it to information. I think that we live in an information-saturated world. I think that we are exposed to, to a deluge of information that would have been completely unimaginable to our ancestors, both in quantity and, and density, you know? I think we are simply overwhelmed by information, and it is getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And without adequate coping strategies, I think it is it is almost inevitable that you will end up having associations, you will end up having fragments of, of cognition, you will end up having fragments of connotation, you will end up having fragments of experience and of memory and of emotional response, which are themselves disassociated from their root cause, from their primary cause. That would have been much more difficult, I think, 100 years ago. But now, because we are so saturated, and I'm not just talking about you know computers or, or phones, I'm talking about the way that we culturally engage with media. The idea that if you go you know for a walk through your local mall, if you go to a local restaurant, you may have four TVs blaring at you, blaring different things at you, and you've got your phone in your pocket that is also giving you Twitter and news updates and all the information you could possibly need. Even if you try and, and distill it out, you're still getting a lot of information coming your way. Even media that has been around for a long time has adapted and evolved. Television is more fragmentary and incessant than it has ever been. Radio is more fragmentary and incessant than it has ever been. We're living in a culture of, of informational deluge. And I love, Chesley, the idea that there is something in there, that, that, that the breaking of the causal chain between experience and response has somehow led us to the the metaphor of the silence or the metaphor of the slender man. I think that's really powerful and really important. We should also acknowledge that these archetypes, and it's not at all clear from the book whether this is true of the unremembered God, but these archetypes often kind of echo a Lovecraftian notion too, wherein knowledge of the thing is dangerous, that it is actually kind of a blessing that we forget, that it is kind of a blessing that we, we cannot retain the knowledge of, of the Slender Man or of the silence, because the more we know, the more exposed to danger we are. So that kind of, I mean, ties us back to the idea that, that you know, in, in Lovecraftian horror, that, that to know of the nature of the universe, to know of the nature of evil, to simply to, to learn is inherently dangerous and fracturous to the, san uh, to the, to the, the, the sanity of the individual. So, Yes, I think that there are a couple of really interesting ideas. Thank you for that. That's, I'm going to be thinking about that a lot after the seminar is done. Yes, that's excellent. Excellent. Um, Casey says it's very human to worship the echo in the void. That's very good indeed. Yes, it is. It is, of course. Yes, good. Good. Mm. Yes. I wonder, says Aaron, if if the unnamed god is the god of Deja and Tendu, the feeling that you have just heard or said something. Yes. There's the old gods, and then there's the old gods. Yes. Shadow goes to Innsmouth, says Aaron. Well, I mean, there has to be some kind of crossover there, right? I mean, Gaiman has written a little bit with Lovecraftian imagery and a little bit with uh, Lovecraftian, um, a kind of Lovecraftian cosmology. Um, yeah, it would be very interesting to see how that works out. Yeah, good. Good. Great. Okay. Uh, that has now put me behind, so I need to pick up the pace. Um, hey, you guys, let's get to the introduction of the spooks, shall we? Let's do this. At three in the morning, by his watch, the spooks returned to interrogate him. Two men in dark suits with dark hair and shiny black shoes. Spooks. One was square-jawed, wide-shouldered, great hair, looked like he played football in high school, badly bitten fingernails. 
The other had a receding hairline, silver-rimmed round glasses, manicured nails. While they looked nothing alike, Shadow found himself suspecting that on some level, possibly cellular, the two men were identical. They stood on each side of the card table looking down at him. How long have you been working for cargo, sir? Asked one. I don't know what that is, said Shadow. He calls himself Wednesday, grim, all father, old guy. You've been seen with him, sir. I've been working for him for three days. Don't lie to us, sir, said the spook with the glasses. Okay, said Shadow. I won't, but it's still three days. Again, while we're talking about the silence, while we're talking about Slenderman, here we have another echo that is... Well, I guess less, less ubiquitous now. It has been somewhat uh, somewhat exhausted by repetition in popular culture now. But if you go back to the time that Gaiman was writing this book, back in the year 2000, this trope was everywhere. This is the Men in Black trope. This is the Agent Smith from the Matrix trope. This is every anonymous, bureaucratic civil servant law enforcement officer. This is every FBI version that we've seen, or every every FBI representation that we saw in the late 1990s, every representation of, of the CIA that we saw in the late 1990s. This is all of them. This is that archetype entirely, which is completely appropriate. I have seen some criticism that the spooks somehow indicate a failure of Gaiman's creative vision, that there's, that there's almost something about them which is less than it should be, that this is a failure of his ambition, this is a failure of his clarity, this is a failure of his investment in the secondary world. That is, I would emphasize, from my perspective, at least emphatically untrue. He's wielding an enormously powerful and contemporary myth, and he's doing so with, with profound acuity. Now, it is true that the spooks are a little less impressive now, 15 years later, than they were when the book was published, but that's a product of, of the movement of time. I'm looking forward to seeing how the TV show handles this scene because I'm certain that we're gonna get this scene. So I'm interested in that adaptive process, but yes, when the book was released, he was wielding contemporary mythology, a kind of contemporary mythology that really has its roots back in you know, the UFO craze of, of the 1940s even, but certainly into the 50s and 60s. The idea of men in black before that idea was turned into a trope itself, this is what he's talking about. And that's enormously powerful, enormously purposeful. And as we'll see later when we meet their employer or their, their orchestrator, their manager, I suppose, uh, then we're going to, to th that is going to be left completely clear to us. There's no way that this is simply a failure of Gaiman's creativity. Yes. Chesley says, on a cellular level, identi identical, that reminds me of Agent Smith in the second Matrix. Yes, yes, good. Um, Aaron says, yeah, the faceless government secret police projecting our own discomfort and paranoia into the impersonal and dangerous bureaucracy. Perfect, Aaron. Absolutely. The spooks is a part of American myth, says Angela. Yes, certainly, um, yeah, certainly contemporary American myth. Certainly late 20th century American myth. Yes, yeah. Good, good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I have to wrap up in 10 minutes, so I guess we should probably keep moving. Um, so this is our introduction. I, I, I mean, there, there's nothing here besides the the myth here. There's nothing here besides the uh, besides the trope. And if there is a criticism of the scene, I don't think it, it rests in its detail as much as it rests in um, in the amount of time that it takes us to get where we're going. Honestly, because not only have we seen this scene play out, Shadow has evidently seen this scene play out too. He's kind of aware of the movement of the story at this point. So it does perhaps linger a little, but it's it's engaging. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, all right, let's move on because, well, something surprising happens. Uh, Shadow falls asleep, and when he wakes, having dreamed of people crying for help, he finds Laura. Puppy, said Laura, you have to wake up. Please wake up, hon. There was a moment's gentle relief. He'd had such a strange dream of prisons and con men and down at heel gods, and now Laura was waking him to tell him it was time for work, and perhaps it would be time enough before work to steal some coffee and a kiss, or more than a kiss. And he put out his hand to touch her. Her flesh was cold as ice and sticky. Shadow opened his eyes. Where did all the blood come from? He asked. Other people 
she said. It's not mine. I'm filled with formaldehyde, mixed with glycerin and lanolin. Which other people? He asked. The guards, she said. It's okay. I killed them. You better move. I don't think I gave anybody a chance to raise the alarm. Take a coat from out there or you'll freeze your butt off. It's okay. I killed them. The... Oh, Cedar Heights is calling out a, a connection with uh, Good Omens there. That's really interesting. Yeah, there's a very good chance I'm going to talk about Good Omens in the near future. I am in a game and kick right now after reading American Gods, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, uh, Vivian says, Sticky is a gross addition, like she's melting. It is possible that that's the case. Rereading this scene, I couldn't tell to what extent Laura herself is sticky and to what extent Laura is covered in the sticky blood of those that she has just completely devastated. It could possibly be the latter because Shadow is clearly looking at her when he asks, where did all the blood come from? So that's possibly the case, but yeah, either way, not good. Either way, not pleasant. And not at all reassuring. It's okay. I killed them. Cool. Thanks. Good. Good. Mm. Yeah. Or covered in blood and cremation. Yes. Yes. Good. <laughs> Keep the game and going, says Angela. Yeah. Good Omens is really good. And Good Omens will in turn lead me to talking more about Pranchett. You guys, I'm just going to be doing this forever. That's patreon.com slash pointnorthmedia. Thank you for your support. Um, so here we have the inhumanity of Laura. It's fascinating that Laura hasn't been directly present in the narrative. She has still been a shadow on the periphery of shadows. Excuse me. She has been a presence on the periphery of shadows awareness. She has been haunting the background of the shot here as we've moved through the last few chapters. But this return is sudden and is striking and is, again, the forcible intrusion of the supernatural into the natural, of the magical into the mundane. It was one thing for Laura to be ambiguously present. I mean, not really ambiguously present, but it was, as we saw after their discussion, Shadow was trying to hold on to the idea that she wasn't really, really there. But now there's no question. Now she has taken action. And we have to look at what she wants. Let's look at the final slide of this chapter. Hey, you guys, we made it all the way to the end of chapter six. Laura, what do you want? He asked. You really want to know? Yes, please. Laura looked up at him with dead blue eyes. I want to be alive again, she said. Not in this half-life. I want to be really alive. I want to feel my heart pumping in my chest again. I want to feel blood moving through me, hot and salty and real. It's weird. You don't think you can feel it, the blood. But believe me, when it stops flowing, you'll know. She rubbed her eyes, smudging her face with red from the mess on her hands. Look, I don't know why this happened to me, but it's hard. You know why dead people only go out at night, puppy? because it's easier to pass for real in the dark. I don't want to have to pass. I want to be alive. I don't understand what you want me to do. Make it happen, hon. You'll figure it out. I know you will. Okay, he said. I'll try. And if I do figure it out, how do I find you? But she was gone, and there was nothing left in the woodland but a gentle gray in the sky to show him where east was and on the bitter December wind, a lonely wail that might have been the cry of the last night bird or the call of the first bird of dawn. Shadow set his face to the south, and he began to walk. We're, uh, yes, Princess Ostrich says, love that bit about the blood. Vivian says, salty is not an adjective I'd use for blood. Metallic, sure. And I thought that same thing, except that I think metallic would render it less human. I think there is something about the organic human visceral connection with salt and of course the salty connection with other fluids which spring from the body. Um, I think there is something primal, there is something organic, there is something necessary and vital about salt in that sense. So I, you're right, not a word that I would use necessarily to describe blood and yet for me in, in context it works. Sarah says blood seems salty to me. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Casey says, a lonely whale that might have been the cry of the last night bird or the call of the first bird of dawn. Blurring of boundaries, says Casey. Yes. Another liminal state. And here, caught between worlds, the boundary between worlds is necessarily more thin. So again, 
much as we did before, and much as we did with with Zoria on uh, the uh, Zoria Polokanaya on on the rooftop with the moon and the the Liberty Dollar. Again, we're kind of. Gaiman is leaning on this magical realist idea that perhaps we are betwixt and between. Perhaps the world is not at all what it seems to be. Perhaps Shadow is imagining this in whole or in part, but then we're anchoring it in absolute reality. No, Laura was just really in his hotel room. No, he still had the Liberty Dollar. No, this really happened. He really was captured by the spooks. He really was liberated by the excessive violence of Laura, and now he's free. Yeah. Good. Um, you know, the, some spoilers, uh, to which I cannot refer, I guess, here. That's just fine. That's just fine. Um, oh, Angela asks, what kind of narrative device is Laura's intrusion? Is it too easy to get Shadow out of his situation? Um, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. It's, um, hmm. Laura is established, so it doesn't feel like any kind of deus ex machina. It feels as though really what the scene is about, what the spook scene is about, and I think this is particularly true in the book because of the similarity between the spook scene and the, the earlier scene, the, the scene at the end of the second chapter with Technical Boy. Those scenes kind of play out very similarly. Hey, mysterious folks showing up, asking you about your relationship with Wednesday. We've kind of done this once already. Really what the scene with the spooks is about, I think, is about Laura. And that's evident in part from where we end the scene because Laura's desire to be returned to life, Laura's motivation, the fact that Laura even has motivation suggests that it is that, that she is more than just a narrative contrivance, that she's more than just a convenience to get Shadow out of trouble. The scene with the spooks doesn't really accomplish all that much except in service to Laura and Shadow's story. So for me, that's the that's where the focus is, and that works really rather well. So I hope that's uh, a satisfying answer. I hope you like it. Um, is it you catastrophe? Asks Chesley, inviting me to talk about Tolkien. Uh, no, no, I, I would argue not you catastrophe because um, you catastrophe demands catastrophe. You know, uh, disaster has to befall Shadow and then good has to come out of it. Um, no, her intrusion is just, it's, it's the intrusion of another character. It's the intrusion of another actor with, with motivation and agency within the frame of the narrative. Um, it would be narratively no different than Wednesday showing up and rescuing him or Chernobog showing up and rescuing him. It feels to me as though it's a consistent part of the world like that. I mean, when I say no different, clearly there are emotional ties which are different and it tells us a lot about Laura that we didn't know previously. It, it again, pushes her back into the spotlight here at the heart of the narrative and now gives Shadow additional motivation for going forward. So for me, it actually works quite well. C can I assume from the responses here in the YouTube chat that it works less well for some of you? Are you... Uh, are you unhappy about some of this? Zombatastrophe, says Sarah Thomas. That's the rarer kind of eucatastrophe. Yeah, that's the eagles are coming. The eagles are also decaying. That's weird. Zombie eagles. Only in this weird crossover of American Gods and Tolkien, I suppose. Yes, yes. Um, Jonathan says, Shadow and Laura living in boundary conditions. Yeah, that won't come up again. Sure. And Casey says, I love that though by, by vision he knows where the sun is rising, his other senses tell him it could be getting darker yet. That's beautifully observed, Casey. Thank you for that. Yes, good. Good. All right. That I think we'll do. Gene has to run. I think we all have to run. That is actually time, but we did it. We made it all the way through to the end of chapter six of American Gods. So we are now in the process of writing the ship. We're now in the process of getting back. This is, as I said, the fifth session. So we should buy, uh, this is the fifth session of book discussion. So we should, according to the original schedule, now be done with chapter 10. We're not done with chapter 10. You guys, we're a third of the way through the book, a little less than a third of the way through the book, rather than half of the way through the book. That's just fine. As I said, I'm going to continue to add extra sessions so that we can continue discussing the book in the depth that it deserves. Next week, I'm actually going to swing for chapter seven and eight, because I feel as though those are a little more manageable. So we'll do what we can with that, but we'll see how far we can get. Yes. Good. Yes. Oh, Chesley says, sometimes I question Laura's morals. First she has an affair, then she mercilessly kills. Well, at least with regard to the killing, 
we acknowledge that because she is dead, it becomes less complicated. She isn't apparently bound by the same morality. And of course, we have to question to what degree Laura is really Laura, to what degree she has been brought back and to what degree this experience of death has transformed her. I mean, even if she is 100% herself, even if there is a, an absolute continuity of existence and memory and identity for her, she is as much herself as she could possibly be, she has still died. This is enormously powerful. This is going to be transformative. Um, are we judgmental about Laura's affair with Robbie? Um, I mean, yes, though I think the book, the narrative, and certainly our perspective from Shadow, all kind of encourage us, I think, to be less judgmental. We're never at any point, I think, encouraged to see Laura's relationship with Shadow, her marriage to Shadow, as being somehow untrue, as though in the absence of a defining love, she turned to Robbie. That doesn't seem to, I mean, the physical absence of a defining love, she turned to Robbie. That seems to be true, at least. But the, it, it doesn't seem to be the case that, that she and Shadow were anything other than completely in love and potentially at least completely happy, but for that absence. Are we critical of Laura for that? I mean, yes, in part, but I think it's probably a kind of, of, of human failure of which we can be understanding, of which we can be somewhat forgiving. Certainly Shadow is, which which kind of cues us up to, to follow in his footsteps with regard to Laura. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cedar Heights says, how much does the coin change her? It gives her pseudo life, but does it change her? Your guess is as good as mine at this point. We will get a little more evidence later in the book to, to resolve that. Yes, yes. Good. All right. Laura is death wanting life, says Cedar Heights. That's it. That's it. All right, so we're going to swing for seven and eight next week. I'm not terribly confident about that, but we'll do what we can, and at least we'll get part of the way into chapter eight. Um, stay tuned to pointnorthmedia.com. You can find all of the, uh, the, the the forthcoming schedule and all of that. I haven't prepped next week's schedule yet, so I can't quite tell you what time that is going to be at. If I had to guess, I would guess it's probably going to be another two o'clock, four o'clock session, although actually next week it might be in the evening. So stick around. It's probably going to be either... 2 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock Eastern, or 9 p.m. Eastern. One of those? Who knows? Stay tuned. Head on over to pointnorthmedia.com, sign up for the newsletter, or follow Point North Media on Twitter or Facebook. That's facebook.com slash pointnorthmedia. You'll get all of the schedule updates there, and there are links. If you go to twitter.com slash pointnorthmedia, the pinned tweet right at the top is a link to the broadcast schedule. That's just a Google calendar that I update when I get the opportunity. So you'll be able to see the rest of everything that we're doing this week and then everything that I'm doing next week too. That will do it for this discussion. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm and your positivity and for helping me cross this finish line with, with oh, just time to spare. Just, just easy, really. Just coasted across the finish line there. I will be back next Monday to talk about the second episode of the Stars Adaptation with Elizabeth and with Daphne. That is going to be a super fun discussion. If you haven't heard that already, the first episode of that, head on over to pointnorthmedia.com. You can grab it right now. Guys, great to talk to you all. I will talk to you all very soon. Until then, take care. <laughs>